I hope you hear you hear my heart and the last message about um, who who's this for? This is for not really prophecy experts. I'm really concerned about the babes in Christ who've been tossed to and fro, uh, who've never had a chance to really see the meat and potatoes of the prophetic word, and it's all just been a mystery. It's been presented as something arcane and complex. It's been presented uh, sensationalistically in a fearful way uh, with many winds of doctrine by people who themselves have not studied to sow themselves approved. And, you know, it is, with the prophetic word, the prophetic word is just the Bible, okay? It's, uh, it's the whole of Scripture, it's the whole counsel of God's word, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Um, but the prophetic word to understand Bible prophecy eschatology if you want to call it that uh the unfolding of god's plan and the sequence of the events and how things connect and all that it does take a careful piecing together with a sober mind just you have to study to show yourself approved and if you don't if you don't follow the rules of the law like law of first mention and expositional constancy which are just funny are fancy ways of saying that the way God uses language is consistent throughout the whole of the Bible, that the Bible interprets itself, that we're not left to private interpretation, that scriptures that have signs are, uh, the signs generally will be interpreted somewhere else in the scripture, and it's for the diligent student to go look that up. And if there's a mystery, something that's like not readily evident from the text in front of you, uh, then God will have to reveal that in its time, and usually it's it it it, it will come through the uh, study of it will come through the study of the scriptures at some point. You know, Daniel was a student of prophecy, not just a prophet. Okay, that there's no such thing as a prophet, so called, who's not a student of prophecy. And as we're going to look at Daniel 9, we're going to see that he was studying the scroll of Daniel of Jeremiah and determined that it was the time for him to pray a certain prayer. He was motivated to pray because he understood the time he lived in based on his study of the prophetic word. Uh, you know, someone told me today that they were kind of turned off by the by. I made the mistake of sending some, th th this all kind of kicked off because I made the mistake of sending someone Chuck Missler's 70th weeks because they were confused about Bible prophecy. And, and honestly, this person, uh, they, they had a panic attack about a year ago about the aim of the bee. Uh, and this person's been tossed around by that stuff. And, and I didn't have any good resources. And I just thought, you know, if I could give them some good resources, that they could get grounded in the, their assurance in the scripture and get out of the sensationalistic garbage, it will help stabilize them. But when they heard Chuck Missler, uh, their response was like, well, he's, he's prideful and he's intellectual and there's no way he could understand the prophetic word because he's not spiritual. I can tell he doesn't understand spiritual things. And so I'm turned off entirely. I can see now that you're studying prophecies. So I'm going to avoid all those uh, videos. I'm, and I just think the Lord has, has revealed these to children. And, uh, you know, this whole idea of having to study to uh, and study your whole life to understand prophecy, that just doesn't make sense. And that's not how God does things. And uh, I, I can understand where she's coming from emotionally. But there is a place... For, you know, you, whether you like Chuck Missler is not the point. And I can't recommend him. And that's why I'm doing this is because people need to have an introduction to these things. And I'm doing, I'm taking my time because my purpose really is to edify the saints. And one thing that's missing from prophetic study is edification. They, they, they treat it like a hobby. Uh, a lot of the teachers treat prophecy if it's some, as if it's something different than ministry and they can talk and talk and talk about the kingdom and the dispensations and all these different things. And yet, uh, they don't know what ministry is. And they don't, and I, and I would say that even Chuck Missler falls into that category that 
as much as I fell in love with the word because of listening to him, um, what we're doing is a little different because we are really trying to nourish babes in Christ and settle fears and establish hearts in grace, you know? Uh, and I want to make sure that everything is coated with milk and meat, you know, and that it's dripping with Christ. I, I really, that's the main focus, but, um, that's what's missing. And, 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 you know, still though, whoever is, is teaching this stuff, has to I say I'm not a I'm not a prophecy expert I you know not compared to these people who've spent their whole lives in the minutia and I'm no Daniel but at the same time I wouldn't dare teach it if I didn't have some grasp and spent quite a bit of time uh in it and there's things that I won't touch because I don't know you know so we're getting into Daniel 9, and that is for the student. And even Jesus, when he referred to it, said, uh, you know, when you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let him who reads understand, let the reader understand. It's understood that you are a student of prophecy. Uh, and, and that is a student of the scripture. And there's a place for being a student of the scripture. And what we see in the prophetic com so-called community the grace so-called community is that they're the people who are teaching not they're not even teaching the people who are sensationalizing bible prophecy are not students of the scripture point blank that's why they reject the doctrine of christ you know the testimony of christ the spirit of prophecy the testimony of jesus christ it is not about the magog invasion and knowing that oh russia is invading ukraine that probably sets them up so that that's probably backing Gog into a corner. And yeah, we can see that geopolitically, but who is Gog? And what does that have to do with the testimony of Christ? Why is it that you can talk for hours about that? But if I tell you the church is not under the new covenant, you go, you blasphemer. <laughs> because when you, when you go back and you read the people who, like uh, I was looking at Clarence Larkin who diagrammed out uh, the 70th week at, at 150 years ago or whatever, he did these excellent architect. He was an architect who did diagrams of these things just from the scripture, not from the teaching of men, but diagramming out what people, what, what the Bible teaches vi to give visual uh, representations of what the scriptures say. Uh, it's very clear from the literal reading of the scriptures that the new covenant, uh, Daniel nine twenty seven ends the last the, really the, the the final step is to bring in the new covenant for Israel, uh, and that is yet future, and that is for the house of Israel and the house of Judah, uh, and that has to do with turning away their sins and bringing in righteousness, not just in the heavens, uh, positionally, before God, but actually in manifestation on the earth. Um, that's what the kingdom is for. And it's the study of prophecy. This is what the study of prophecy is, is what is the distinction between Israel and the church? And what is Christ's inheritance as the seed of David, the seed of Abraham? What is he possessing? What is he taking possession of? What is his qualification? And what is he going to do with his possession? Okay. And we, we, when we divorce prophecy from Christ himself and his inheritance, then we lose sight of who we are too, when we study prophecy. And it, when you do that now, it's like you're watching a superhero movie or you're in a superhero movie and, and, you know, Superman's coming and he's throwing trains at his enemies and you don't know if you're going to get hit by a train. <laughs> You know, that, that's why it creates panic. You know, my wife, um, she is PTSD triggered by uh, the prophetic stuff. Not as bad now, but for years we couldn't even talk about it. And I didn't understand. I was like, what? This is the, we're talk, the, the greatest news on the planet. That's how it was presented to me, actually, though, was the, 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 the story, God's story of how he's, summing up history and wrapping everything up and bringing meaning 
to this universe that is just absolutely futile without him. He's reconciling all things in heaven and earth and in Christ. And then he has this group of people that he's made co-heirs together with Christ to rule and reign with him forever. And this is the greatest destiny and the greatest event in the history of the universe that the entire creation is groaning for, the manifestation of the sons of God when Christ presents the many sons of God, his body, which is his fullness, to the Father and says, Behold, I and the children you've given me. And the Father receives the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and receives the result of his work in Christ, the building of the ages, the masterpiece of God, the church. Um, all of this is glorious. It's a glorious uh, thing to look forward to and to rejoice in. And that's, praise God, how I was introduced to prophecy. The guy who, even though I listened to Missler and I listened to a lot of this stuff, it was never a thing of big, of a lot of fear for me. Possibly because I was, before I was saved, I grew up in a family that sat around, they were atheists and they would sit around and talk about the condition of the world uh, in a very fatalistic view, like, you know, population control should be implemented and abortion should be mandatory. And, uh, you know, I mean, just a couple Thanksgivings ago, we were on, on my grandpa's farm and they were talking about that, you know, all their survival plans and their prepping you know, because they think the dollar is going to collapse and society is going to collapse and they can articulate at length why society is going to collapse and they've got plans for it. And we don't have any skills other than being a musician. I have no skills to offer. So I'm not invited to their little compound. <laughs> These are extremely intelligent people. Um, smarter than me. I mean, you know, I, I have a kind of reputation as sort of being a brainiac, you know, on this YouTube channel. Well, my family, they're all really, really smart, but they're atheists. And I grew up in a world where there was no hope, you know? Uh, so be, I grew up reading sci-fi thinking, well, if we could have alien contact, maybe that would be, be hope for humanity to escape our plight. You know, we, we were looking, we were, it was like we were facing, uh, looking down the barrel of a gun, looking at the future. That's how I grew up. That My parents and my grandparents and family believe that this human core human human experiment has come to an end we're too stupid and we're we're destroying ourselves and uh the writings on the wall but they're not believers it's really interesting so it's really doom gloom so for me the prophetic message i read was a better than any sci-fi i had read it better than any fantasy I had read and it was so full of hope it gave me a future and a hope I was without God in the world without hope alien and stranger from the covenants of promise and without God in the world and then God quickened me and made me alive together with Christ and seated me with him in the heavenlies then in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards me in Christ and I had a destiny you know, this, I, in the first year that I got saved, this is what I came to know through the prophetic word. And as I shared that word with people, lots and lots and lots of people got saved. And it's not because of anything about me, uh, like I'm Mr. Special, sorry. It's not because I'm Mr. Special, but it's because of the fire of that prophetic word. And then, you know, religion put it out, put the fire out, so to speak. Uh, and I could feel the enemy really fighting this, you know, uh, like I said, I'm not going to try to control this. I'm not, I'm going at my pace. Um, and I'm just being me and my ADD is worse than it's ever been. Uh, Jewel, <laughs> the other day she texted me, she said, I just want you to know your ADD is absolutely terrible now. I go, I know it's really bad. It's I, and it would drive me nuts. I don't know how people are listening to me right now. My, I mean, I, but this is, this is where I'm at right now. And, uh, so bear with me, but we're getting to Daniel nine and Daniel was a student of prophecy and prophecy is a hopeful word. It is not a doom and gloom word. Okay. And yes, it takes some study. And it takes some diligence to put the whole thing together. And that's why I said, look, 
don't think that you have to build from scratch. You know, this person was telling me, I'm done. I'm, I, I just think God's hid it from the wise and he's given it to babes and I'm not going to rely on teachers. I'm just going to go my own direction and the Holy Spirit will show me. It's like, okay, so you're going to reject the work that people have done before and God's given gifts to the body, you know. Uh, and I'm trying to tell you that if you don't understand Daniel 9, 24 through 27, you are not going to be able to see. You're not going to have a framework to see that we're not in the tribulation. You're not going to have any kind of protection to see that the seals haven't been opened. That kind of stuff. So you will just be open to any wind of doctrine. I've, I've been stressing that all the aberrant, cultic, prophetic scenarios that toss everybody around come from a failure to appreciate the significance of these four verses. Uh, so we're going to look at four verses, okay? And um, let's just get into them. I'm done with all the talking. <laughs> uh, but we're going to have to read the whole chapter with some commentary. Uh, okay, this is Daniel... And he says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Asherus. Now, I, I, I kept saying Artaxerxes, but it's not Artaxerxes. It's Xerxes I. Artaxerxes is later. Xerxes was uh, Ahasuerus, same guy, uh, king of the Medes, who was or the king of the Persians, king of the Medes, um, who the movie 300 was about, you know. And... Uh, Darius was his son. And Darius, I guess, is the uncle of Cyrus, who is another person who had Daniel had favor with. It's just amazing. But he says, uh, Darius, Darius was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans is the Babylon, Babylonians. Remember, Abraham was called out of the Ur of the Chaldees. This is Babylon. Um, in the first year of the reign of of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years. So he's a student. Whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Okay, so he's studying uh, Jeremiah, right? He's a student of prophecy, not just a prophet. Like I said, there's no such thing as a prophet who's not also a student of prophecy, uh, it's not, prophecy is not the gift of being able to tell people's future and read their mail and be a psychic. A prophet is someone who is immersed in an understanding of the prophetic word and is able to speak it forth, uh, understands God's mind as revealed in the scripture and speaks according to that. If you want to say, you know, if you, if you want to know what a prophet would be in the New Testament sense, because we're all called to prophesy, it's to speak according to the testimony of Christ for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, in the Old Testament times, the Spirit came on people and they did prophesy where it was, thus says the Lord. We don't do that in the New Testament time. Now we have a different kind of principle where Christ is in us and we learn from the scriptures and we grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ but and we speak uh, according to the portion of our faith. And let every man speak as the oracles of God, and we minister according to the grace that we've received, according to our capacity. But we can prophesy. We speak forth what we know of Christ with confidence. And we speak according to his testimony, God's testimony concerning his son. We can prophesy, okay? Um, but you can only prophesy to the degree that you've understood and seen God's prophetic word. And he was a student of the prophetic word. But uh, this is Jeremiah... Uh, uh, you can look this up. It's Jeremiah 25. And basically what happened was that God had, they had this thing called a sabbatical week where every seven years they were to let the land rest. They were to um, farm the land for six years, right? And then on the seventh year, they were to let the land rest and live by faith and based on the provision that God provided for them for the six years. Uh, and it was a, it was a step of faith. You would lose your profit. You weren't allowed. If you were a farmer, you weren't allowed to farm for that year. And that was a sign that you understood that everything is provided by the Lord. 
God instituted from the very beginning of creation the Sabbath as a not as a burden to man, but as a symbol that God wants man to rest in his completed work and that God is the one who provides everything. Rest uh, and Sabbath is the recognition that God provides everything and that he's the one who sustains us. And it's associated with faith and it's associated with blessing and it's associated with holiness. And it's associated with the good land, inheritance, enjoying Christ and the reality of the holies, holy of holies, uh, having God's presence, his blessing. So the Sabbath in Genesis was the day after God completed his works and rested, he blessed it and sanctified it. So the, according to the law first mentioned, that's where we see bless, you know, holiness the first time is related to this concept of rest. So again, you can't have rest uh, I'm sorry, you cannot have holiness without rest. A lot of people want to make holiness a matter of works. It's not a matter of works. It's a matter of resting in the finished work of Christ. And that's what the Sabbath rest was a picture of. But Israel, because of unbelief as a nation, did not keep the Sabbath years for 70 of them, which is 490 years. They ignored the, 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 they went into apostasy, basically, but one of the things they did not do was let the land rest. They farmed all through it, and they ignored God's rules about that, as well as the feasts, as well as setting up high places, and, and they degraded it in many ways. And this all led, uh, they, they fell into worse and worse apostasy, as we know, you know. Now, they were breaking the law, right? They were breaking God's covenant, and the covenant was the Mosaic Covenant, which was what they had to live under as a nation in order to stand, stay in the land. Now, individuals were justified by faith, not by that covenant, but by the covenant that God made in Abraham's time that actually gave them the inheritance of the land uh, by their faith in Christ, because the, the land was promised to Abraham's seed, which is Christ, and the ones who actually believed in Christ, that there would be a seed that would come, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, and he would be the one who would eventually deal with sin. And that they knew that when they offered up their sacrifices, it was a picture and that the real sacrifice was yet to come. Those people were justified by faith and were heirs of God by faith as individuals, no matter what the nation did, okay? So the law was never given to individuals. It was given to a nation to keep, and it was for that nation to be able to stay in the land. And one of the provisions for the nation to be able to stay in the land was they had to keep this the Sabbaths, uh, and especially this whole keeping the 70... This is really important, this, because you won't understand this prophecy if you don't understand what the 70s are, 77s are, the 7s, the, a week of years. A week of years is seven years or six years you let the uh, you work the land. The seventh year you let it rest. Well, they didn't do that for 490 years. So when God came in and judged them with the king of Babylon, he said, uh, well, here's what he says. He says, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation for her iniquity in the land of Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual uh, desolations. And all nations shall serve him and his son. Okay, so he's saying Nebuchadnezzar is going to take you into captivity so that I can let the land rest. Because you didn't let it rest 70 times, which is for 490 years, you ignored the Sabbath of uh, each of these, you know, s s weeks of years. Uh, you, you ignored the seven years for 490 years. Uh, I'm going to have you stay in Babylon for 70 years to let the land rest because you owe me 70 Sabbaths. And then after the 70 years are accomplished, I will visit you and perform my good word and cause you to return to this place. So that's what he prophesied through Jeremiah. And that's what Daniel was studying.
Okay, so again, Daniel is taking the scripture literally. He recognizes that it is the 70 years are up. He realizes he's in Babylon and it's time to go back according to God's prophetic word and being a believer in the prophetic word. He goes, it's time to pray. Okay. Now the 70 years is really important because God, based on that understanding, is going to prophesy about 70 weeks of years that remain for Israel's history, prophetic history. And this is the timeline uh, where we get what's called Daniel's 70th week from and why we understand that there is a seven year period yet set aside for Israel's history before the kingdom to be wrapped up and for their salvation to be brought in. Um, so he said, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. He says a representative of the whole nation. Uh, so, so he is an individual justified by faith, but he's praying for the nation because he has dual status as an individual and as a citizen. And this is where people get confused because they don't understand, well, I thought Israel was justified by works because they had to keep the Sabbath and they had to keep all these things. Yeah, they did in order to be constituted as a nation and dwell on their land and have the blessing in the land, but... When they were scattered, uh, the individuals who still believed didn't lose their relationship with God and, and get hardened and unsaved. They were not kept by the works of the law. There were no works of the law that he could have really done. You say, well, he could have kept the moral law. Yeah, but he couldn't keep the Sabbath. That's part of the Ten Commandments. You say, yeah, he could. He could He could not work. Oh, really? You think that the king of Babylon said, okay, you can have the Sabbath off? No. I'm sure he worked on the Sabbath, number one. Number two, he couldn't, keep, he couldn't do the sacrifices because the Sabbath was not just don't work, but it was also participate in whatever the Sabbath, uh, you know, involved as far as the holy um, services, which required a functioning priesthood which then required, therefore, the ceremonial law. You could not keep the moral law without the ceremonial law. Because, number one, if you break, if you, if you take up one point of the law, you obligate yourself to the whole thing. Like it says in Galatians, if you're circumcised, you obligate yourself to the whole of the law. That's why you bring yourself under its curse. So if you are circumcised, you, bring, you put yourself under, thou shalt not kill. If you... Try not to, if you try to be justified by thou shalt not kill, you are putting yourself under the weight of you shall have be circumcised. So it's not like you get to pick between the moral and the ceremonial. It's all one law, right? And James said, well, what profit is it if you commit adultery or don't commit adultery, but you do covet or you do commit murder? And, and Jesus said, you know, you, you, it's even if you lust in your heart, you know, that you've committed adultery. But James says, if you break the law in one point, you've broken the whole thing. And if you break the whole thing, the curse falls on you. As an individual, it's absolutely impossible to keep the law because the law requires, I mean, even if you could morally keep all the commandments, as an individual, you could not keep the Sabbath because it takes a nation to keep the Sabbath. Uh, you've got to have the priesthood. Right, and that that and and if you don't belong to the tribe of Levi, you're not allowed to offer uh, a sacrifice. Right, you need a high priest, you need a tabernacle, you need the holiest, you need the. So this just shows that it's ridiculous to think that anybody was ever justified by the law, because it's there was almost no time in Israel's history where they were ever even in a position as a nation to keep it perfectly as a nation much less the individuals, but the Babylonian captivity is one of the examples that shows us that even under the law, because this is still under the law, uh, individuals are justified by faith, okay? Um, so he's got his, so, so individuals are justified by faith because of their uh, belief in the promise to Abraham's seed, just like we are. But to live as citizens of Israel and enjoy the benefits of being an Israelite with the blessing of being an Israelite as a mortal at that time, there was the Mosaic law. And since the nation had 
so badly profaned the Mosaic law and abandoned it, they were under judgment and they were in Babylon for 70 years. And there was no temple. It had been destroyed. The priests had been killed. The Babylon took all the precious metals and the gold and, and the uh, in vessels of the temple. Uh, Belshazzar has a party where he's drinking out of the priest's vessels. He's drinking wine and stuff. Uh, I mean, it's just absolutely abominable. Um, because the the nation was absolutely destroyed and decimated. Jeremiah is weeping and wandering around. Now, is he not justified anymore because they can't keep the law and they've been judged? No. There's a difference between the judgment and God's treatment of them as a nation, which is the branch of a mixed multitude of mixed of believers and unbelievers, and God's dealing with individuals. God never deals with individuals according to the law, except as a schoolmaster to show us our need for Christ. He always deals with individuals to justify us by faith in Christ, but with a nation, he has an arrangement called the Mosaic Law, and then he has another arrangement which replaces the Mosaic Law, which is what? The New Covenant for future Israel, which is for a nation. Okay, um, But he here is praying... In sackcloth and ashes for his... He, now, he is identifying himself with Israel, but we know he was a just man and spotless, right? So, uh, but he says, I pray unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to those that love him and to those who keep his commandments. He said, oh, see, it's justification by works. No, he's talking, he's standing in the position as the nation. Um we have sinned and committed iniquity, and we've done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and judgments. Neither have we hearkened to thy servants, the prophets. Which he did. He's, he is reading Jeremiah. He, know, he's, he is a prophet. It was his belief in the messages of the prophets that from the very beginning when he went into Babylon as a child, he refused to eat the king's meat, and he sanctified himself right away because he believed the testimony of the prophets and yet he's saying we have not hearkened to thy servants thy prophets so again he's standing as a representative of the nation and they have a dual status they're they, they are on the one hand uh individuals justified by faith on the other hand they have a status as members of this nation now we're a little different because our status as individuals in Christ is also as members of the body of Christ and it's one and the same because it's one life you know it's all grace but at that time you stood in grace before God but in the nation in, in the sense of being a functioning member of the nation you were under law that's hard for us to get our mind around uh because we don't have that kind of we don't have a theocracy you know Neither have we hearkened to thy servants the prophets, which spake in the name of our kings, our princes, and our fathers, uh, in thy name, to our and 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 uh, to all the people of the land. Lord, righteousness belongs to thee, but unto the us confusion faces as to this day, to the men of Jude, Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all of Israel that are near, that are far, through all the countries where you've driven them, because of the trespass which they've trespassed against thee. Lord, to us belongs confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we've sinned against thee. To the Lord belongs mercies and forgiveness, although we've rebelled against thee. Neither have we obeyed the voice of our Lord God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by the servants of the prophets. Yea, all Israel, again, the country, the nation, have transgressed thy law even by departing, that we might not obey thy voice. Therefore your curse is poured out on us, and yet he is the president of uh babylon <laughs> so uh again this he 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 is in he is blessed his socks are blessed off and he, you know he's got his socks blessed off like joseph and yet he doesn't look at that he try he counts that all as dung because he values what god values and considers it curse you know i don't care that i'm rich in this world I want what God wants. I'm zealous for God's house. I miss Zion. You know, uh, in the Psalms it says, um, 
how can we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? When they asked us to sing a song of Zion, we were like those who weep. We hung our harps on the willows. We can't, you know, we feel like that in institutional churches sometimes. It's like, you want us to sing hymns about Jesus Christ, and then you're going to talk about law for the whole service. It just, and then you want us to finish off with another hymn about Jesus after you've adulterated our ears with your Babylonian jibber jabber. <laughs> uh, it grieves you, you know. Um, but anyway, I, I love his heart. Um, th therefore the curse is poured out upon us. Now God had told them, look, if you go to Babylon, if you listen to the voice of the prophets, you'll be blessed and be multiplied there. The ones, the only people who were cursed were the ones who stayed in Jerusalem, who refused to listen to the prophets. They had their own prophets. Uh, there was Jeremiah and Ezekiel who were saying, God's going to curse this place. Babylon, ba Babylonian king is going to come and he's going to destroy it. Everybody's going to die and he's going to lay siege. They're going to tear down the temple. They're going to kill your children within you. But if you go out and surrender to the king of Babylon, you'll be blessed and obey God and he'll bring you back to this place. But the false prophet said, oh no, this is the holy city. They're blaspheming the people of God and they're blaspheming this holy city and the holy temple and and they tried to prophesy as if this place was uh, the blessing of, you know, enjoying the blessing of God. And how can you say that this is the eternal dwelling of God? And it sounded like they were speaking scripture. You would have had to really have some discernment to know who's who. It sounded like Jeremiah and Ezekiel were speaking awfully negative things about the people of God in the city. But God said at that time, put a mark. Uh, in Ezekiel, he said, "Put a, uh, I think to an angel, put a mark on everyone who mourns for the abominations that are committed in Israel. And uh, there were people who were prepared to go because they'd been grieving over the idolatry and the Babylonian mixture in Israel for years and years and years. All the ones that went to Babylon were ready to go. They're like, this, God's abandoned this place. This place is full of abominations. Jerusalem had become Babylon. And in fact, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar got saved. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, and uh, Cyrus did more good for Israel than probably any of the kings in Israel's last 490 years of history prior to that time. They blessed Israel, they believed in God, and the kings in Israel didn't. So uh, it's just interesting, you know, how... It, it, it very much parallel, parallels today where we are being called out of the institutional church, which is today's Babylon, I think. And, and you know, in Ezekiel, God sh said, let me show you even more abominations. He's looking around. He's, he says, I see women making cakes to the queen of heaven and weeping for Tammuz. And what's that? That is Nimrod's wife and their son, Baal, who is the antichrist who will be a polyon eventually the beast system they're worshiping that instead of jehovah it's a false christ and they're worshiping him in the right near the temple in the temple the priests are i mean it's just a total god hates it jerusalem became babylon uh are invaded with babylonian religion that had actually replaced the true worship of god and god was nowhere to be found and that's what it is like today in christendom is that people are dealing pr primarily uh especially in the institutional churches with the babylonian mysteries but they've dressed it in biblical terminology and people don't know the difference but there's people who will not hear the voice of a stranger that have heard their shepherd voice and they've been grieved and say i can't deal with this God's put a mark on them. He said, put a mark on all those that have grieved inside over the abominations they're practicing in Jerusalem. Those were the ones who escaped with their lives and went to Babylon and were blessed. Okay. Now he says, yay, all trans, all, but the rest perished in Israel uh, when the siege happened and, and Nebuchadnezzar went in and destroyed them or put them in slavery. I think a lot of them were still in, in Israel, but were slaves or something. But he says, yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even departing, that they may not avoid, um, obey your voice. Therefore, the curse is poured on us. Again, is he cursed? No, they're blessed. But he's identifying with the country, with the nation, with the nation. 
Um, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Now, remember the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 28, was when he read it and the people all said, all that God has promised, we will do. And, and in that law, it said, look, if you do everything in here, you'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in, blessed going out, uh, above only and not beneath, the head, not the tail. But if you don't do these things, you'll be cursed. And he described in the, uh, let's see, actually, if maybe I can, uh, maybe the cross reference will have it. Um, this is the first prophecy of the diaspora. There's two, there's two prophecies in Deuteronomy of what's called the diasporas. One is uh, diaspora which is a dispersal or a scattering into um, Babylon. And then the second is into the nations, which we saw for the last 2,000 years. Uh, hold on. But if you read Deuteronomy 28 and you read all the curses, it is absolutely terrifying. It's, you know, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before your enemies and you shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and they'll be, and it shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Uh, and the Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt and the emeralds and the scab and the itch. And, and, and a lot of people believe that the Holocaust was the, was the, were, was the uh, absolute outpouring of the greatest example of all the curses listed in Deuteronomy 28. I don't know about that, but, but I mean, obviously the, the camps in Auschwitz are really bad. And this is very descriptive of just, the, every kind of possible awfulness. Uh, but this is where, um, in Deuteronomy 28, he says, The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which you set over thee unto a nation which you neither or you or your fathers have known, and you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, and you shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among the nations where the Lord shall lead thee. Uh, that is, people believe, is talking about the Babylonian captivity, which is where... He is now, um, uh, these cross references did not, it's too much to read. If you read Deuteronomy 28 through 31, you will see that there are so many curses and it's so awful that if they do not fulfill the law, it's hard to believe that anybody would ever have thought to say, oh, everything that you've promised we shall do <laughs> because the curses and the oath that God said he would do to them as a nation, if they didn't keep it, were awful. But is, is Daniel experiencing all those curses? Is he botched and uh, plagued and a byword and serve, you know? No, he's blessed. He's the president of, you know, we see quite a few people in Babylon, Nehemiah, Ezra, uh, uh, Zechariah, uh, Daniel, um, that, that are exalted. And then other people that live fairly decently, you know, they're, they're like middle-class Babylonian citizens. They're not cursed because they obeyed, they believed the prophets and were individually justified. But the ones who did not believe and yet sought to be justified by law were bound to it as a nation and were subject to its curses. So, uh, not only did Jeremiah prophesy it, but it goes all the way back to the law of Moses. Uh, and again, it just shows that the law of Moses is for the land. It's related to your staying in the land and it's related to the nation. Um, and Paul tells us very clearly that the law was for the nation of Israel. It was not for individuals and it was for transgressions. It is a ministry of condemnation and death. No individual can be justified by it. Um, so anyways, and now he's confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges and has judged us by bringing upon us this great evil under the whole heaven, which, uh, has never been done on Jerusalem as it is written in the law of Moses. All this evil has come upon us yet. We have ma made not our prayer before the Lord, our God, that we might return from our iniquities and understand the truth. Therefore has the Lord watched upon evil and brought it to us. For the Lord our God is righteous, and his works which he has done, for we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord, you have brought thy people forth 
out of the now he's reminding him of his faithfulness to his covenant okay so he's saying okay according to moses you dealt with us righteously as a nation but now he's reminding them of another covenant what covenant the covenant based on the covenant with abraham isaac and jacob and now O lord our god you have brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and have gotten thee renowned, as at this day we've sinned, we've done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, <clears throat> I beseech thee. Now when he says thy righteousness, he just made a reference to you brought us out of Egypt. Why did he bring him out of Egypt? Because he had promised the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he was going to give the land to their seed. Now that's really important because when it comes to the prophetic word, and knowing that God is going to fulfill his prophetic word literally, right? It's a matter of his righteousness and the faithfulness to his covenants. And so it's a really big deal that he has something called the new covenant for Israel. And it's a really big deal that he's going to graft Israel back in. And it's a really big deal that he promised in the scriptures to bring Israel back into their land after he dispersed them the second time, which we'll look at all that later, but... Actually, Petra did a video already, uh, and I put it in a little playlist, but she just did a video on Ezekiel 36 and another one on Ezekiel 37 talking about the return of Israel into their land and why God's doing it. But this is all his righteousness. When you talk about what God's righteousness is, it is his faithfulness to his word and to his covenants, right, uh, and his promise, um, and that he's just even to forgive us our sins. He, he appeals to... He says, okay, according to everything you said, you did judge the nation, but also according to your righteousness, remember your covenant, not the Mosaic law, but the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And by that covenant, I know you're going to preserve the, the nation because you have promised that land. Uh, so this is what, a, this is, this is what a prophet is. Okay. What is a prophet? A prophet is a person who understands God's testimony to the point where he thinks like God does about big picture stuff. He knows how to appeal to God's decrees and God's nature and what God has said and believe it and know, okay, well, this is how we should pray and this is what we should expect. It's not that a prophet is a magician or a psychic or a witch who goes, well, I got a sense in my spirit and I got a, you know, I had a word from the Lord. No, that, that is not it. The prophet is someone who studies the scriptures, uh, understands the ways of God and is able to speak according to what God has revealed of himself and his nature and his person and even appeal to God. You know, Abraham was a prophet according to God. I told a pastor that once and he was surprised, <laughs> but I showed him in the scripture that Abraham was a prophet. And what did Abraham do when God told Abraham he was going, he said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What did Abraham do? He said, well, surely you will not destroy, far be it from you to destroy the righteous with the wicked, right? Uh, what was that? That was an appeal, um, an, a, a prophetic appeal from Abraham to God based on his understanding of who God is, what righteousness is. So he must have understood that Lot was justified by faith. And knew who God was and what God would and wouldn't do. That understands the boundaries of God's character. You know, these people who are all saying, Oh, I had a word from the Lord and they got a rapture channel. And one minute, and he's binding people's conscience left and right. And oh, now we got to fight it. And now we got to, you know, there's no coherent message at all. And th they don't care if they contradict the gospel or not. They don't even realize they're contradicting the gospel. They're not speaking according to God's character at all. They're not prophets. And yet they all say, the Lord showed me this, and I had a dream about that, and the Lord says, and the Lord says, and the Lord says. You know what they are? They're false prophets. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, 
And I, you know, the re again, the reason we're studying this stuff is, and, and the reason I'm going into all this detail is we're, we're, we're just using it as an opportunity to settle our mind about the character of God. The prophetic word should establish you in something consistent about God's character. It shouldn't make you feel like you don't know what's coming next, right? And a lot of times when you're done hearing these prophecy people, you don't know what's coming next. It's out of character. It's not consistent with the gospel. It's not consistent with God's righteousness. He's not faithful to any of his covenants, it doesn't seem like. I mean, it's just a mess. But Daniel knows how to pray according to God's covenants and according to the study of the word. He knows God's faithful to his word and he appeals based on God's covenant, his righteousness, and his word. He appeals, he, 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 pray, he knows God's nature as described in the word and he knows God's nature from seeing him faithful in his life but also in the history documented in the scriptures of his dealings with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he studied the scriptures. You know, we get comfort from the word. We learn who God is. So he can pray in a way that most people wouldn't be able to pray. Put you or me in the same situation, would we even know what to pray? We wouldn't even think to pray. You know, we'd just go, uh, 70 years is up. I wonder if God's going to do something. Who knows? We'll, we'll see. You know, we'd go, we'll see, because I don't want to be presumptuous, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, O oh Lord, according to thy righteousness, I beseech ye, according to thy righteousness, let thy anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem. See, I did a, mer a message one time called, thy, Your mercy is contingent on his righteousness. Meaning, God, in, in uh, Romans 3, says that Christ is the manifestation of his righteousness, that he may be just and the justifier who believes in Jesus. And we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins. Um, God's forgiveness of us is based on his righteousness. It's not like he is, oh, I feel sorry for you, I'll forgive you. No. It's because he's faithful to his covenant. He forgives you for, because of a covenant he made with Christ. He forgives you for Christ's sake. In Ephesians it says uh, that we're to forgive one another as God in Christ, uh, for Christ's sake has forgiven us. He does it based on a covenant. When, when it talks about his loving kindness and his righteousness, we're talking about his faithfulness to his word, uh, to his nature, and to his covenant. Stop it! dogs sorry um okay so so he's saying according to your righteousness turn your he's not saying have mercy on us and relent please find it in your heart to have mercy on us we really did it hopefully you'll have mercy on me a lot of people pray that way when they pray for forgiveness i really sinned big this time if god doesn't forgive me i'm screwed lord please have mercy on me that's not faith Faith is, I recognize that based on the blood of Jesus Christ, I have the right to come forward boldly and say, Lord, based on your righteousness, I thank you that I have access. <clears throat> He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, right? According to your righteousness, I beseech you, let your anger and your fury be turned away from Jerusalem, your holy mountain. It's, it's your holy mountain because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jer Jerusalem and your people are become a reproach to all that are around us. Now, therefore, O God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause your face to shine on the sanctuary that is desolate for your Lord, for the, for the Lord's sake, for your sake, for your sake. Ah, uh, O God, incline thine ear and ear here. No, he's saying, you know, don't do it for my sake. Do it for your sake. This is about your name. I'm fine in Babylon. I'm the president. I'm doing good. He could have just enjoyed it, you know. But he's zealous for the things that God is zealous for because he actually loves God. Oh, God, incline my ear and hear, uh, thy ear and hear. Open thy eyes and behold our desolations and the city, which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. 
So it's the same thing. We have no righteousness of our own. This is justification by faith. This is what it looks like. Um, oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thy own sake, O oh my God, for thy city and thy people that are called by thy name. Now, when you read Ezekiel 36, which is... Uh, where God says he's going to return them to the land after the second dispersal. Um, it's interesting because he says, prophesy therefore concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains, um, therefore, uh, surely the heathen around you, they shall bear the name. Let's see. Hold on. I, uh, come on. Sorry. He says, I'm not going to do, oh, I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the heathen, wherever they went. Therefore, thus says the house of Israel, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you profaned among the heathen, where you went. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, where, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall be sanctified before you in the eyes. And I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you to your land. So again, this is, now that's talking about the end, the new covenant days. Uh, but it's for his sake. It's because of his righteousness to magnify his name. Uh, to magnify his name so that, you know, his righteousness is put on display. Uh, sorry, these dogs are driving me nuts. I'm, I, I'm so tired of animals. It's like a zoo around here. Uh, but it's the same thing. It's the same. So, so that's God speaking, but Jer Daniel prays the same way. Do this for your name's sake. I hope this isn't too much detail for you guys. I, um, you guys, yeah. But most people have gone through some of this stuff, so I'm, I'm getting into the things that are inspiring me. Uh, okay. So, now we're back, and while he's praying, uh, forgive, defer not, okay, while I was praying and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel. Now, Gabriel is the same messenger that announced to Mary that Jesus would be born. Uh, he would be called the son of the highest and would inherit the throne of his father, David. He's, he is a messenger angel that comes and confirms God's word concerning his covenants. Um, and anyway, the, the one I'd seen in the beginning, vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me. He said, oh, Daniel, I'm coming now to give you skill and understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went forth, and I am come to show thee, for you are greatly beloved. And I think that that's unique. Uh, I, I, I need to find that in the scripture, but I'm not sure God says that about anybody else in the old Testament, a prophet that you are greatly beloved. He really has a heart for God. He's very unique. Uh, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision here. Here we go. And I'm just going to read it and then we'll come back and study it. <clears throat> 